Welcome to East Newton Baptist Church. We're glad you joined us this, this morning. Welcome, church family. Good morning, East Newton. Let's go to church. Good morning, East Newton. Let's go to church. Good morning, East Newton Baptist Church. Let's have church. Good morning, East Newton Baptist. Welcome. Good morning, East Newton. Let's go to church. Good morning. It's so nice to see you. Hey, we're glad that you could come. Why don't you come on in and join us? Well, come on. Well, now that you're here, we can get started.
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are welcome here come thank you that we can come to you and you will listen Lord the Holy Spirit that lives within us Lord help it to bind us Lord even though we are not gathered under this one roof Lord we feel your presence Lord we thank you for being through being with us through this time Lord and Lord, we know that there's people praying that's never prayed before. And Lord, we just hope that this paves the way to a revival across this land. Lord, we pray that for those that their, their talents are to take care of others, the military and the, the first responders, Lord, those that that run into a situation that's not good, Lord, instead of running away, Lord. We just thank you for their talents and their courage. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that we take care of each other and that we pray for each other and lift each other up. We thank you for how good you are, Lord, because you are. Lord, just be with us through this time, through this worship time through this entire week Lord and we just pray and we look forward to the day when we gather together what a reunion that will be Lord we thank you for your love and salvation in Jesus name I pray Amen well good morning it's good to see you today uh, I want to make you aware of a few announcements as we begin our worship 
Uh, number one, we are in the midst of our Annie Armstrong offering for North American missions. And if you have not had the opportunity to give, uh, we just encourage you to do that. Again, just a reminder, uh, you can drop your uh, offering by at the church if you're out and about. Uh, you can also mail it in. We're checking the mail diligently. Uh, also, you can give online. We, uh, we uh, have appreciated all those who have given. Uh, we will be giving an update on the financial status of the church in the next couple of weeks. Some have asked about that. Uh, but I'll just tell you this. Things are going remarkably well in spite of how things have been going in our world these last few weeks. So thank you for your faithfulness. Also, the revival that was scheduled to begin next Sunday has been postponed. It will be later in the fall, so we'll keep you apprised as to when the new date has been scheduled, and we'll let you know about that as well. Uh, the staff will be getting together in the next couple of weeks to make some hard decisions about some of the events that will be taking place in the next two months uh, and if we're going to be able to pull those off. So keep, uh, keep an eye on our Facebook page and keep an eye on our uh, website as we put forward some announcements on what's going to be going on in the next few months. Speaking of that, there is no, uh, at this point, date set for us to return to gathering together in our worship time. Uh, we, we don't know what the future holds. We know there are some very strict requirements for those that have decided to go ahead and meet, uh, wearing masks, sitting six feet apart. Uh, so we are going to continue at this point to provide uh, an online worship service so that, uh, that you can get the full experience of that. And we'll let you know soon when we may be looking at coming back as soon as the government gives us some guidelines that we can live with for gathering together. Okay, uh, so there we are. We'll, we'll keep you posted as much as we can. Uh, you know what I know now. Uh, so it is good to be here today. If you're watching for the first time, we want to welcome you. We're glad you decided to be a part of our worship today, and we want to thank you for coming. Uh, let's continue in worship together.
church here in this building, but we don't have to be in this church to flood the gates of heaven with prayer and praise. I want everybody to just take a moment to just thank God for that salvation that was given to us 
on the cross for what Jesus did. I'm going to play through this song, and just we as a church, those who, who are watching this, those who know Christ as their Lord and personal Savior, I'm just going to encourage you to just pray and just thank God for saving your soul. Father, we do truly come to you today and thank you, Lord, for the salvation that comes from you alone. And Father, as I was sitting here just worshiping together with our praise team this morning and thinking about that day when you step out on that cloud and return, Father, what a wonderful, magnificent day that will be. And Father, we rejoice because we are your children. We rejoice because we have the free gift of salvation. And Father, we know that we can worship wherever we are, God. We can lift our, our lives, lift our hearts, lift our minds, lift our songs and our prayers to you wherever we are. And Father, we do look forward to that day when we can gather together again, where we can glorify your name together but Father, we know that where two or more are gathered together, and Father, we know that where people are gathered together in an online community, you are there amongst us. And so Father, we praise you, and we worship you, and we glorify you, and we give you first place because you are our everything. Thank you, Lord. And Father, as we enter into this time, a Bible study and sermon and edification. We pray, God, that you will help us, Lord, every step of the way to learn a little bit more about who you are, a little bit more about who we are, and a little bit more about what we are called to do. Thank you, Lord, for this relationship that we have with you. Help us, Lord, to learn to be like your son, Jesus. And Father, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we come to the close of our study on the book of 1 Peter. And it's been a good study. I've enjoyed every minute of the way. So as we begin today with our last few verses... And you turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. I would just remind you that last week we talked about the role of the shepherd. Now this week we will talk a little bit about some foundational Christian attitudes that we are to have in the church. The world that we live in is built on an environment of information. I'm sure every day you are flooded with information from news sources, from friends. Uh, you are flooded with information from a TV show that you may be watching. And we live in a day where we want to know how stuff works and why it exists. Remember one of my middle son Cameron's favorite shows growing up was How It Was Made. He had this fascination with wanting to take stuff apart and figure out how it works. New scientific answers are being found every day in relation to the nature of the universe, in relation to the world that we live in, in relation to diseases, and hopefully there's some progress being made in our current disease 
our current virus. And yet still when we come to the sphere of religious thought or Christian thought in particular, the thoughts surrounding God, even though people live in an information age, they want to approach religious thought in relation to Christ in a purely mystical way, in a purely spiritual way. When it comes to theories about God, the answers that are given in our world today, particularly in the secular world, but sometimes and even sadly in the church, is an anti-intellectual thought. Largely, we give anti-intellectual thoughts to the nature of God and the nature of our experience with Him. And so the prevailing system of the world in knowing something spiritual or knowing God is that you only have to feel something, that there just has to be a feeling. And so the academic arguments for God or the academic intellectual understanding of God are pushed to the side and religious thought is based on emotion and subjective feeling. This kind of thinking has further been promoted by the postmodern mindset. The one that says absolute truth does not exist. You can't know absolute truth. And I always thought that was a peculiar comment. Someone is saying absolutely that you can't know absolute truth, thus stating an absolute truth, thus refuting their argument. So people are left with the idea that religion is simply about whatever you believe. Everyone can just come up with whatever makes them feel good, whatever makes them feel comfortable about the world. And we have moved away from the propositional truth uh, or the facts surrounding God or the intellectual thought surrounding God. Relativism is another word that's been thrown around in the last 10 or 15 years, that truth is relative. What this says is what's true for you doesn't necessarily have to be true for me. And what's true for me doesn't necessarily have to be true for you. It's okay if you believe one thing about God and I believe another, both truths can be exclusively true. Two Contrary opinions about God can both be right in the idea of relative, relativism. What's the problem with this type of thinking? Well, the problem with this type of thinking is simply this. God has absolutely told us what is true. And he's absolutely told us who he is. Now, he's not told us every detail of his character. He's not fully revealed all of his glory to us as of yet, but he has revealed enough information about him that we know his character, we know facts surrounding who he is, and God has given us the answers to many of life's questions, and specifically, he's given us answers into how we should approach him, how we are to be saved, and how we should walk with him after we're saved. You don't come to know God through feelings or emotions. You come to know God through absolute truth as God has revealed it to us in his word, the Bible. And so, it is through our minds, it is through the revelation of truth, it is through the working of the Holy Spirit that we learn who God is with our minds first. This Understanding of who God is in our minds naturally leads to some emotion. If you meet God and do not have an emotional experience, I question whether you've ever met God. But you have to first meet him with your mind and then you experience emotion. Uh, then, Then you understand that he loves you and then you love him back as a response to meeting him in the mind and then in the heart and then the heart loves him back. Listen, God has always asked us to approach him with the mind first. Let me say that again. God has always asked us to approach him with the mind first. 
He says in Isaiah 1.18, Come, let us reason together. Come, let us think about these things together. Come, let us engage our minds together about who God is. And we can't be conformed to the image of Christ, we're told, without first renewing our mind. We find out what the image of Christ is in Scripture, and we begin to take on that image as we conform, renew our minds and conform our lives to what we find in Scripture. So it's first a mental exercise. Several scriptures also point to the idea that the mind of the unbeliever is unable to comprehend the truth of God. So there must be a spiritual work that takes place in the mind of the unbeliever that helps them to begin to first see the light of who God is and then to experience him firsthand. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 says, For even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel to the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But even though the mind must be engaged in the process of us becoming a believer, and even if we could take a vote this morning and, and say, yes, it was first in the mind that I engaged my thought process before I ever loved God, even though that is the case, the believer should never approach the Bible in merely and only an intellectual process. You see, even though the mind is primary, it comes first before the emotions can be engaged, even though the intellect is important to our understanding of who God is, and even though there are some academic and intellectual answers to the, to the question of God, to the, to the nature of salvation, all of these things have answers that are mentally focused. We must not approach the Bible in only an intellectual process. Listen to me closely. Spiritual thinking involves far more than simply opening the Bible and studying it, than simply gaining head knowledge. There must be some foundational Christian attitudes that are being cultivated in the life of the believer so that as they approach the Scripture, they approach it with the right understanding, they gain the most from it, and then they're being obedient to what they learn from it to cultivate these foundational attitudes to an even greater level. So, in our final section of 1 Peter, we're going to look at 10 foundational attitudes. That's right, 10. So, fortunately, you have the ability about halfway through to pause this and go to the restroom or to grab another cup of coffee. Uh, this will be probably a little bit longer sermon than normal, but I wanted to get finished with 1 Peter today. So let us look at these 10 attitudes as we turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 to 14. And as you are at home, I would ask that you stand as we honor the reading of God's word. Verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. 
My Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Father, we pray that you will bless our time together this morning. Pray that you will bless the reading of your word and our study of it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Ten foundational attitudes of the Christian mind that must be cultivated for us to gain a proper intellectual understanding of what the Bible teaches. The first foundational attitude is this, submission. Submission. He says this in verse 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. As a shepherd submits to the chief shepherd, the flock is to submit to the shepherd. Submission is a foundational attitude of the Christian faith. And it is a theme that Peter has already covered in the letter when he talked about submitting to the government, when he talked about submitting in our families, uh, talked about submitting to masters and slaves and all of that. So he's already covered very specifically the idea that a foundational attitude of the Christian life is that we are to submit to those who are in authority over us. And so his final area of foundational attitude and, and uh, uh, how we should live is in submission uh, in relation to submission, is in the relationship of the church. He is calling the flock to submit to the leadership of the church. And he specifically here targets younger men. Um, why? Well, he doesn't specifically say why he targets younger men, but it could be because younger men usually are kind of headstrong and aggressive and kind of move their own way. Uh, I don't know. He doesn't say, but the issue of submission is not just for the younger men of the church. It's for all people in the church. Everyone must submit to the leadership of the church as they submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the biblical qualifications uh, evidence that God is working through these leaders. Their leadership should be in the way that we mentioned last week. Uh, there should be the right attitudes for leading. There should be the right motives for leading. Uh, and everything should be focused on what we talked about last week. But as such, the church is to submit to these people that are placed in positions of authority, to the pastoral leadership. And, and here's the real truth. If we're required to submit to the government, and if we're required to submit to our employers, and if we're required to submit even to our families, how much more are we required to submit in the church? It just makes perfect sense. So Christians are to be submissive in all areas of their lives where people are placed in a position of authority over them. The church is the vehicle for which God uses uh, this vehicle to equip the saints of God for life, for ministry, for doing the things that God has called us to do, for directing the path that God has called us to go along. And here's the simple truth. We are called to submit in the church. We're called to submit in every area of our lives. So if we want to learn who God is, if we want to grow in him, if we want to learn how we should live in relation to him, we must be submissive to the leadership of the church as we sit under teaching and preaching and leadership and conform our lives to the image of what God is calling us to do in Scripture. We must submit. Secondly, the next foundational attitude is humility. Very closely related to submission, we must be Humble. Look at verse 5 and 6. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Here it is. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. These inseparable qualities of submission and humility go together in the Christian life. Only the truly humble person will submit themselves to others. Only those who are seeking after the interest of others more than they are seeking after their own interest through humility will submit themselves to others. Peter calls the church to clothe themselves with humility. 
Listen, humility should be something that we put on like a garment, Peter is saying here. It's something that we wear, and it should be just a natural part of our appearance, a natural part of our makeup, a natural part of our lives. Jesus is God. We remember when he was here on this earth, he was God, but he was also humble. He was a servant leader. It was Jesus who washed the disciples' feet in an act of humility, and it was him who humbled himself even to the point of death. The God of the universe allowed the people of this earth, the sinful people of this earth, to nail him to a cross. He could have stopped it at any point. He could have uh, brought down a legion of angels. He could have, with a word, ceased the cross from happening. But he humbled himself even to the point of death, death on a cross, the scripture tells us. So if Jesus is the God of the universe and without sin is humble, how much more are we too to be humble? Perhaps the greatest motivation for the believer to practice humility is that the Bible teaches that God opposes the proud. Those who are arrogant, those who are proud, those who think more highly of themselves than they ought to, God has set himself in opposition to those people. Why? Because people who are created human beings, people who are sinful by nature, people who rebel against God on a daily basis have no right or authority or anything in them that they should be proud of. There is nothing good in us that should cause us to boast. And so God sets himself against us as opposed to the proud because there's nothing good in us. There's nothing that we really have to be proud of. Even our salvation is a gift from God, and there's nothing to boast in about that. And so we are to be humble. Because God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble, we are to humble ourselves, the scripture teaches today, under the mighty hand of God. This just simply means that we're to place ourselves in humility under the sovereign authority of the God of the universe, the sovereign control of the God of the universe. Here is what we said uh, in the last couple of weeks. God is God. Why do we have a problem with that? God is God, and he's in control. He's in control of every single thing that happens in his created universe. And if he is in control, then we are to humble ourselves under his control, under the mighty hand of God. We must believe it, and we must live it. The verse goes on to say that God will reward us for, uh, for being humble. He will exalt us as we're humble, just just as we are humble before the Lord, he will lift us up. What a, what a beautiful picture. So it's not us lifting ourselves up. We humble ourselves. We think of ourselves in the right tone, in the right attitude. We live in humility, and the Bible says God is the one who will exalt us. So we don't have to exalt ourselves. God will do the exalting because of what he does through us, not anything that was in us to begin with. We are joint heirs with Christ, the Bible teaches. We will share in his glory. We will be exalted. It's not our own, but we share in his glory, so we must be humble. We must submit. We must practice humility. Thirdly, we must trust. Look at verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, about three weeks ago, we had a sermon on specifically casting our cares on God, casting our anxieties on God, and seeking first the kingdom of God. Part of our rebellious sin nature, though, leads us to believe that when we experience trouble in this life, we must experience it and face it on our own. That maybe we don't want to bother God because we think maybe our problems are insignificant, or maybe we seek to minimize the suffering that we experience in our lives. Maybe we feel like we can handle the situation that we are facing better than God can handle it, or perhaps we are simply in open rebellion to God for his plan in our lives, and so we desperately want to retain control of our lives because we don't want God to do something that we don't want him to do. 
But listen, the simple truth is we were never designed to live life independently on our own. We were never designed to live, God, live life apart from God. We are created by God to be in a relationship with him, to walk with him, and to have him carry us through the times in our lives that are difficult. And so we must be dependent upon God. We must trust God. We must learn that dependence on God, that basic attitude of the Christian mind of leaning on God in all times, but especially in the times when we have worry. You may have worry right now. You may have worry about the situation that's going on, about maybe your financial situation, or you may have worry about your health, or you may have worry about what's going to happen in the world as a result of all this is going on. Or you may worry that you're not, you're not able to get to church and, and, and worship together, and you may worry that somehow your relationship with God is suffering. My friend, trust in God. We are simply to place God in the very center of our lives, lean on him, be dependent upon him, and care. he cares about the smallest details of our lives, and so we cast our cares on him. And so we talked about this a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to belabor this point, but my goal today is just to tell you that we need to trust God more and more and more with the anxiety that's in our lives because he affirms that even in our darkest times, he cares for us. Fourthly, self-control. Self-control is another foundational attitude of the Christian mind. And he just says simply there, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. This is a concept that Peter has already mentioned in this letter. It has to do with the controlling power of the Holy Spirit. Instead of being intoxicated with the things of the world, instead of being impaired or controlled by the things of the world, we are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be sober-minded. It means to be self-controlled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. It means we do not allow the things of the world to take us away, to take us on a path of open rebellion against God. And so this is the concept of ordering our lives and disciplining our lives as we follow the Holy Spirit's leadings so we are not intoxicated by the things of the world. When we're focused on the world, we do not understand the truth of Scripture fully, and we certainly do not obey the things of Scripture fully. Are you controlled by the things of this world? Are you focused on the things of this world? Are you drawn in by the things of this world? Are you focused on the Holy Spirit's working in your life? Are you focused on doing what God has called you to do? Self-control. Fifthly, vigilance. Vigilance. One of the reasons that we are to cultivate attitudes of self-control, trust, humility, and submission is that we face relentless opposition by Satan and his demons. Do you know that Satan wants to get into the church? He wants to get into the lives of Christians, and he wants to distract us and destroy us and destroy our testimonies. And so Peter urges in verse 8 for us to be vigilant, for us to be alert. He says, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We are to be alert. We're to be attentive. We're to be watchful. It is given here in the form of a command. This is not a suggestion. It's a command. It means you are always to be, as a Christian, in a state of alertness, in a state of watchfulness, in a state of readiness, for whatever your adversary is seeking to do to destroy you. Who is your adversary? Satan and his minions. He is the adversary of God, and he's the adversary of God's people as well. And so we see that Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion. The picture is that the lion is crouching around and creeping around and waiting to pounce on us at any moment and destroy the work that God is doing in our lives. Several 
strategies are used by Satan in his plan to attack and undermine the plan of God. One is to attack Jesus, and one that I've seen so thoroughly used by Satan in our world today as we look out at the world and as we listen to people preaching uh, uh, and, and see people on TV preaching and hear people on Facebook giving their opinions about who God is and the gospel and all of these things, one thing we find out is one of the ways that Satan seeks to destroy the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is through false doctrine and false testimony and false gospels. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times in the preaching ministry, a deficient gospel is a false gospel. If you don't tell the whole gospel, it is a false gospel. If you, don't, if, if you say more than the gospel, if you say that we have to add works to it, then it's a false gospel. And so there are all these people out there not giving the proper picture of what the gospel actually is, and there are people who believe they're saved through works, there are people who believe they're saved through church attendance. There are people who believe as long as they pray to God that there has to be no evidence in their lives. They just simply have to talk to God every now and then that they are walking with God. And I've even seen it that people who are at funerals of someone who is a, a sinner, who has never talked about God, who has never talked about Jesus, they believe their loved one is in heaven. We have a strange world that we live in where people do not understand the gospel because I think as a whole the church in the United States of America has not done a good job presenting the true gospel and so that's one way Satan attacks by destroying the message of the gospel by confusing people by infiltrating the church with false doctrine by having people out there who are false teachers who are confusing people and then they have a confused state they do not understand the true gospel and so they do not come to Christ. Another way that he attacks us in the church is by focusing on us to help us to get inwardly focused. So, so he, he helps us to worry more about you know, whether we like the music in church or whether we like the facilities that we worship in or whether we are comfortable in the sanctuary or whether we are in the class we want to be in or whether we, you know, just we're focused so inwardly that we can't focus on the world. If we are fussing and squabbling and focusing on the things in this church more than we're focusing on the world, Satan has already won the victory. We need to be focused out there. It's not us against us. It's us taking the gospel to a world that we love. And we must be a united front. So Satan wants to keep us Focused inwardly, focused on maintenance, focused on doing things in the church rather than doing missions and sharing the gospel and loving on people outside the church so that we can share the gospel with them. He also attacks believers by destroying their lives. He wants to get in there and mess up your marriage. He wants to get in there and cause your children to be rebellious so that you can lose your testimony. He wants to destroy your reputation at work. Satan is wanting to destroy your testimony so that you can't bring others to Christ through your life, through your gospel testimony witness. And so we have to be on guard. He's seeking to destroy us. He's seeking to destroy our marriages. He's seeking to destroy our testimony. He's seeking to destroy our churches. He wants this virus to close churches all across the United States of America. But I say to you that we need to allow God to work in the midst of this virus, and we need to be stronger as a result of this by being watchful to Satan's ploys and Satan's tactics. Satan also works to get us so focused on ourselves that we become trapped in sin, we become trapped in our own lives, and we don't do the things that God has called us to do. And effectively, we become ineffective for the kingdom of God. So Peter says he wants us to be alert, to stay alert. And here's, here's what I like to tell people. There are Christians who have been a Christian for a while, and there are Christians who have been a Christian for a short while, but they believe that they are above falling into some kind of temptation. 
Oh, they may believe that they can be tempted to share a small white lie or something like that, but, but no, I'd never commit adultery. No, I'd never embezzle money. No, I'd never steal from anybody or murder anybody. I, here's what I want to say to you. We need to be watchful because there's not a single one of us who cannot give in to some kind of temptation. In the right circumstance, in the right place, all of us are We need to be watchful because all of us are susceptible to giving in to temptation, especially if we drop our guard, especially if we're not paying attention. So we need to be on guard. We need to be vigilant. We need to be ready because Satan is looking to pounce. Number six, strength. Look at verse nine. Resist him. We're still talking about Satan here. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. He is saying here that we we must be strong and resist the ways of temptation against Satan. And what he's really saying here is we're to take our stand against Satan. We're to be ready and we're to resist him. You know, get, get ready to fight him. Get ready to, to resist and get ready to fight. Listen, we, we don't live some mamby-pamby type of life in the Christian church. We, we fight. We fight against Satan. And we, we are battle-hardened from the things that we've been through. And we have the armor of God to help us to fight and the Holy Spirit in us to help us to fight. And so we are to take our stand against the schemes of the devil. How are we to resist? Well, he says we're to be firm in our faith. This means that we're to take our stand from a solid foundation of faith, knowing that when we face Satan, we may look like a puny, weak little thing, but God is standing behind us. God is our foundation. And so we stand against Satan because God is in our corner and he is fighting with us. Jesus taught that we should resist the devil and he'll flee. And you remember what Jesus did. You say, how are we to resist the devil? Well, you need to take a a plan from the playbook of Jesus Christ. When he was approached by Satan and attempted by Satan, he quoted Scripture. Listen, you can't quote Scripture if you don't have it in your heart. If you don't study it daily and if you don't memorize scriptures, you can't quote scriptures unless you spend time in them. But Luke chapter 4 and verse 3 to 4 says, He the devil said to me, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. You want to fight against Satan? You better know the scripture so that you can quote it when he comes against you. The truth is that scripture is our sword our weapon against temptation. And what a mighty weapon it is. So we must hide his word in our heart. Or we'll give in to temptation. We must resist him. Before he moves on to another attitude, Peter gives a a small word of encouragement here. He says, remember, you're not the only one who faces temptation. Remember, you're not the only one who is going through this. Everyone everywhere who is a believer faces the same thing that you do. You are not alone. So stand firm knowing that everyone who is a believer is standing firm to resist the enemy. Foundational attitude number seven, hope. Look at verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. In the midst of our suffering, here's the truth. You can count on God. We have a hope. It's not a, I wonder if God is going to help me, hope. It's not, I wonder if I'm going to heaven, hope. It's a biblical expectation that when God has made a promise that he will help us in our times of need, he always keeps his promises. God is always good. And God always keeps his promises. He is always working 
for our good, even in the difficult times, even in the times where we feel like he's far away. He is always working for our growth and our sanctification through our trials. And we will accomplish his plan for our lives if we will submit ourselves to him, and he will always accomplish his plan. And so we base our lives on that hope as we focus on his glory, as we give him the first place in our lives. Peter calls him here the God of all grace. He brings to mind the loving nature in which God showers grace upon the believers that are part of his church family. Uh, He showers grace on us from the day of our salvation until eternity. And what does Peter say he will do? He says he will restore, he will confirm, he will strengthen, and he will establish. What does this mean? Confirm, I mean, restore means that he will bring about the completion of what he has begun. It's an idea of he will perfect that which he started in us. How do you like that? He will restore you. Confirm, he has given you his stamp of approval. You who were not a people of God, you who were lost, you who were destitute, you who were without hope have been given the stamp of approval of God. You have been given his stamp to say, this is my child and he will be or she will be with me forever for all eternity. This is my child. He will restore you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you. This just simply means to make you sturdier. How would you like to be made sturdier? How would you like to be made sturdier right now? My friend, God says he will do it. We have that hope. And then he will establish you. He will lay us a foundation. We aren't on sinking sand. We aren't on a crumbling building. We are on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, a firm foundation. And my friend, he is making us immovable so that we can stand in this life, against whatever we face, because we have a hope for the next life. My friend, that has to be in place as you read the Scripture. Hope. Hope. And that should cause us to hope all the more. The more we read, the more we hope, the more strong we get. The more we read, the more we hope, the more established we get. The more we read, the more we hope, the more restored we get, until finally we're in His presence and we're fully restored fully confirmed, fully established, we're fully hopeful. Number eight, worship. Now, he doesn't really command worship in verse 11, but it's interesting that as Peter is working through this, and I'm getting a little worked up here too when we talk about hope and things like that, Peter's working through this and then he launches into a sentence of praise. You know, that's how it is. When, we, when we're talking about the glories of God, when we're talking about the grace of God, man, it makes us just want to shout, just want to praise. And so Peter is contemplating the grace that is poured out on the life of believers, and he's meditating on the, the goodness and the greatness and the, the glory of God through our sanctification and ultimately our glorification. And he says this in verse 11, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter rejoices in the fact that God has dominion over everything for all eternity. How do you like that? God is in control of everything for all eternity. In eternity past, right now in the present, and in eternity future, God is in control. He has dominion. And he does not give a specific command to worship here, but he's showing an example that those who are in Christ launch into spontaneous worship sometime. We just say, praise the Lord. You ever been driving in the mountains and seen the beauty of the clouds resting on top of the Smoky Mountains and say, man, praise the Lord. You ever looked at your spouse and been thankful for what God has blessed you with and said, man, thank the Lord. You ever held a small baby in your arms that has just been born to you and seen the the beauty of the lips and the ears and the beautiful little eyes and said, man, thank you, Lord. Have you ever walked into your church building and seen all the believers that you love and you said, man, praise the Lord that I'm part of this fellowship. And my friend, what a day it will be when we gather together again. 
My friend, the believer's life should be focused on the glory of God every minute of every day. And we should break into spontaneous praise as we move along in this life. Here's a question I have for you. Are you in a continual attitude of worship in your life? Did you worship God this week in your life? Did you spend time worshiping God? And and we can do it right now while we're gathered together, but worship is not just a time where we meet together. Worship is when we serve God with our lives, when we honor God with our love for others, when we live our lives with an eye toward glorifying Him in all that we do. Did you worship this week? It's not just for church. It's for everyday life. It's an attitude of life. Worship number nine, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Look at verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. In the last few verses of the letter, Again, Peter does not specifically give a command on right attitudes of Christian thinking, but he does show us those who are living out things in their lives that should be present in our lives. And here we have the faithful brother Silvanus. He describes the characteristics displayed in the life of this believer, and he shows by example that these traits should be present in our lives. Now, Silvanus, or he was sometimes called Silas, was a companion of Paul and a faithful servant of God. He was with Peter at this time, and he was his amanuensis. That may not be a word that you've heard before, but an amanuensis is basically a secretary or assistant. And so Silas was one who was able to record the writing of Peter as he dictated it to him, as he told it to him. So Silvanus was the one that wrote out this letter. You have to understand, Peter was a fisherman, and so he used someone that was, had a better uh, command of the language to write down his thoughts as he was telling them to him. So Silas was his amanuensis, and he is also not only the one who, de- who recorded the words of Peter, but he would have delivered this letter to the audiences uh, that, that the letter was going to. And so uh, Peter here is talking about his faithfulness to him and giving really a recommendation that the people should listen to him as he presents this letter and as he teaches them about this letter. And so he's letting the readers know that they could follow the example of Silvanus because he was faithful. And so the idea here is that as believers, we should be committed and loyal and faithful followers of Christ so that those characteristics shine through in our lives and our commitment informs our understanding of Scripture. Only then can we understand God's Word and what it's teaching us to be obedient in our lives. Lastly, love. Look at verse 13 and 14. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peter illustrates love in this last few verses. The believers in Babylon would have been the church at Rome. Uh, That's what he is referring to here. He's using somewhat cryptic language because the church in Rome was experiencing far greater persecution than the ones to whom Peter was writing at this moment, but persecution would come. Remember, we said it was heating up, but it had already heated up for the believers at Rome. And so the persecution being escalating, Peter did not want to endanger the church at Rome any more than necessary, so he chose a discreet reference here to say, she who is at Babylon is likewise chosen, sends greetings, and so does Mark, my son. And so here is a message of love, a display of affection. And here they greeted each other with the kiss of love. And so they would actually greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, when we get back, we'll not be able to do that. We'll not probably be able to hug for a few weeks. We probably won't even be able to shake hands, just greet each other with a warm smile and a wave. But the idea is not necessarily that you kiss someone or that you hug someone or that you shake their hand, but the idea is that you genuinely love them, and that love is shown in this uh, attitude of affection when you say, hello, how you doing? So good to see you. We missed you, and you mean that in your heart. So the love of Christ is showing through as we greet one another. One of the amazing things about 
being connected with other believers is the mission trips that I have been on in other countries where their culture is vastly different from ours. I've gone to both Brazil and even the two times I went to Brazil, these two, uh, two experiences were quite different because of the, the things that are changing in Brazil and they're becoming more and more uh, close to what we are in our country. They have internet and all these things. Uh, but when I first went there, they did not have these things, and they were really a third world country. And then I've been to Guatemala and other places. When you go to these places, you're immediately connected with believers, and you feel this strong, loving connection to them, even though you know nothing about their culture or little about their culture, and you know, you le know less how to talk to them. You have to have a translator. If there's no translator there, but you're immediately connected to them. I remember the first time I ever sat in worship in Brazil on my first international mission trip. I sat there next to believers, and I did not know exactly what they were singing. I could make out a few words like Yeshua or Spiritus Sanctus, uh, the Holy Spirit. I could make out a few words, um, Deus, Deo. Uh, God. I could make out a few words, but I didn't know what they were saying. But listen, they were worshiping God, and I felt immediately connected to them, and I immediately loved them without ever laying eyes on them because they were part of the family of God. And so we are to have a love in which our spirit testifies within us that we are believers, and our spirit testifies when we interact with someone who is a believer that they too are believers in this spiritual loving relationship. We are to love one another, and I can't wait to see every one of you packed in these pews as soon as humanly possible. Love is displayed and is an obvious attitude of right thinking. As Christians, we are to seek with our minds we are to focus with God on our minds. And yes, we encounter God with our hearts and our wills as well, but we encounter him first in our minds. And as we seek to grow in our understanding, there should be some foundational attitudes that are present in our lives so that we do not get puffed up with our knowledge, so that we don't think we're more exalted than we are with our knowledge, so that we don't get to come to Christ and, and get this wrong idea of who we are in Christ. We can't give the idea that Christianity is simply a mystical religion. It certainly is spiritual. It certainly is emotional, but it's also very academic. But we can't let the academics go to our head. We must approach God and study his word with the right understanding. And so the attitudes that we've mentioned this morning that should be present, that are displayed in our passage today are submission, humility, trust, self-control, vigilance, strength, hope, worship, faithfulness, and love. Here's the question for you this morning. Are those present in your life? Do those attitudes inform your understanding of Scripture? Are you practicing that? You can't get the most out of Scripture unless these things are going on in your life as you read and study. Won't you begin today just putting this list of attitudes beside your Bible beside your bed, wherever it is that you study your word, won't you begin to, to look at those attitudes every day and make sure you're cultivating each and every attitude as you approach your walk with God? Lost person, you can't begin to focus on your walk with God until you first come to meet him. Salvation is, is a gift of God, but our understanding of salvation takes place in the mind first as the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. So I encourage you to reach out to God. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins so that you could have life and have life everlasting. So once you repent of your sins and come to Christ in faith and accept the gift that he has given you and become part of the family of God this morning, I look forward to hearing from you if you've accepted Christ as your Savior this morning. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you so much for the cross. We thank you so much for our walk with you. We thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. We pray, God, that you will just help us, Lord, to walk in you, to grow in you, to be faithful in you, to be on guard in you, to love others in you, to worship with you. Father, to hope in you, to be strengthened in you, to be watchful in you. Father, to give all these things, humility and submission, the first place in our lives as we, as we serve you, as we walk with you, and as we grow in you. 
And Father, this is a time, Lord, when Satan can attack the church. This is a time where Satan can cause us to not be all that you've called us to be. Father, just we want to give you glory. We want to give you praise. And we want to do these things in our lives. Father, if there's someone who is lost, we pray, God, that you will save them this morning. Father, if there's someone who has not been walking in these ways, all of us, Father, can use to improve these ways in our lives. Father, we pray, God, that you will just strengthen us this morning as we give ourselves to you. Father, you are a mighty God. Father, help us to live under your sovereign and mighty hand. And Father, you are mighty to save. Save someone today. Father, give them your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This is your invitation. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad to see you. Have a blessed week. Let's sing one more song. Our God is greater. Our God is greater.